All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Sal. I call him that because I can't pronounce his last name, even though he's been on the show twice, but he's absolutely delightful. He is a lifestyle medicine doctor practicing, well, he lives in Florida, but with what he does, he can do it other places as well. And he's here today to talk about something that you might not have heard of that I'm going to let him explain, but it has to do with your cardiovascular health. Please welcome Dr. Sal. Thank you, AJ. Nice to see you as always. Same here. So what have you been up to? So the practice that I run now, this concierge lifestyle medicine practice really focuses obviously on, you know, what you know as the pillars of lifestyle medicine. And I've always had a real passion for cardiovascular prevention. So um, I'm actually doing a presentation at the FOMA conference, the Florida Osteopathic Medical Association conference in October, which is on the beautiful Captiva Island. If you haven't been there, it is such a fabulous place at South Seas Plantation. So what I'm presenting on and, and really just to talk a little bit about it today is how do we diagnose cardiovascular disease before something happens? So it's really interesting to think that about 50% of people with a normal lipid profile. So traditionally, you know, the physician will check your total cholesterol and your LDL, HDL and triglycerides. And many people with a so-called normal lipid profile still go on and have heart attacks and strokes. And I've really been interested in the last 10 years or so in trying to figure out what are the best tests to use to diagnose asymptomatic car cardiovascular disease. And at the presentation, we'll be talking about a number of blood tests, but we'll also be talking about this test called Clearly. Well, Clearly is actually the company. This is a CAT scan of the heart that is done. And the software that this company has actually evaluates the uh, and looks at the arteries to differentiate soft from hard plaque. And I'll show you the slides in a bit. What the, what the difference is, if someone has hard plaque in their arteries, it's basically calcified and it's stable and it may cause some problems with blood flow, but generally it doesn't really cause a heart attack. And for there's probably people on the line that have had a calcium score done. The calcium score basically just tells you how much calcium is in the arteries, but it doesn't pick up the soft plaque. And soft plaque, if you think about it, is very friable, it's kind of mushy, and it can actually break off and go downstream and cause either a heart attack or a stroke if it's in one of the carotid vessels. So this is really a game changer when it comes to evaluating people with asymptomatic disease. And I actually did the test myself, and I can, um, whenever we're ready, I'll show, I actually show you my results. But it really allows you to tell someone whether they have a lot of risk for having a heart attack. And then even as importantly, it allows you to set up an action plan for those people to look at their diet, you know, to see how much saturated fat they're getting in. Um, if they're really eating a plant-based diet, and I know that you're such a champion for plant-based nutrition as am I, uh, and then looking at all of the other things that they do in their lives that can cause progression of the cardiovascular disease, and how do we flip that on its head and cause a regression? So wow. I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> that, that, so, so will this technology be available for everyone? And, and how affordable is it? People want to know because so, you know, yeah, the insurance question, pay. Yeah, the second question is probably the, the, the most important for a lot of people. You know, it's available for anyone. Anybody can have it. You just really need a physician's order to get it done. And then obviously to have somebody that can interpret the test for you. Um, you know, at, down at Lee Health, they're, uh, they're actually doing a study at Lee Health. Uh, Dr. Shazal is one of the, is, is the cardiologist that's leading the charge there. And what they're doing is they're looking to, to see how many of their employees have asymptomatic disease that they can help. So they're actually, they've actually paid for about four, over 400 people to have this test done already. Uh, the short answer to your second question is, it's expensive, it's, it's about $1,500 to get the test done. But if you think of it from the perspective of, of cost avoidance, if you will, and disease avoidance, you know, spending $1,500 to avoid a heart attack, 
that if an individual goes into the into the emergency room and is hospitalized for four or five days, they're they're running up many, many thousands of dollars worth of hospital bills. And if God forbid they need a bypass, you're talking about a bypass operation is anywhere from $120,000 to $150,000, of which most insurance companies require the individuals to pay 20% of that. So, you know, for $1,500, if you have risk factors and you really want to know what's going on, I think, and again, I did this test myself, even though I've been plant-based now for about 10 years, I wanted to be sure that my arteries were clean. So I think it's well worth the money. And I have nothing to do with the company, just as a disclaimer, I have no vested interest in the company at all, but I think they, the technology itself is so valuable that we will really pick up a lot of asymptomatic disease. And then for people that go on, that have cardiac catheterizations done, this test can actually help determine who really needs a cath and who doesn't. So it really, as I said before, it really is a game changer to a big degree. Who, who, who is using it now? Anybody we know, like in the plant-based world, any of the cardiologists? So it's really, you know, well, um, Dr. Chazal uh, is the cardiologist that's down here in Fort Myers that's using it big time at the hospital. Um, I, I have not reached out to many other doctors just yet, but at the former conference, because I'm presenting, uh, the company is going to be there so that we can get more physicians involved in using the technology. Um, it's a fairly new technology. I mean, certainly it's been around for a couple of years now. They have really good track record and such. And I think what's going to happen over the next five years is the insurance companies are going to see how valuable this is. And inevitably, it should be at least partially paid for. Wow, that's incredible. So you basically just need a doctor's order. And if you're willing to pay, you but, yeah. do, you, do you know what it runs? Is it in the thousands, I'm guessing? It's 1500 Okay, well, that's like yeah. about an MRI, yeah. Right, right. I mean, it's 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 doable. And again, when you look at if you can prevent disease from occurring, and you can save money on hospitalizations and medications, and improve the quality and the longevity of your life, then fifteen hundred bucks is a couple of days at a hotel. You know, I mean, when you think about it from that perspective, so. And again, I always say to my patients, and I'm sure you say the same thing, is there anything else that you can spend your money on that's more important than your health? I mean, it's a rhetorical question because there really is nothing. And if you think about you know, health as your priority, then when you're spending your money on the number one priority in your life, it's extremely valuable for both the quality of your life and the longevity. Are, are there other tests that uh, people could take, let's say they couldn't afford this one right now that you would recommend to assess their risk? Yeah, you know, honestly, I always say the best test is for the doctor to sit, shut his mouth or her mouth, and actually just listen to how the individual lives their life. As, as you know, from talking to thousands and thousands of people over your career, um, when you listen to how someone lives their life and you get into the details of how they eat and how they exercise and whether or not they get enough sleep and stress and you know look at looking at the the behaviors i think you know to a big degree whether or not someone is at risk so from that from there you can decide then does that individual need a stress test do they need um, a an echocardiogram do they need a nuclear stress test as opposed to a basic stress do they need to have a catheterization? And these are all the details that I'm actually going through with the presentation that I'm doing at the FOMA conference, because I think from the physician's perspective, obviously, and from the patient's perspective, which cardiovascular test should be most helpful in diagnosing that individual? So it's almost like developing an algorithm for which test you should use, depending on what's going on in the patient's life. Thank you. People keep asking what the name of the test is, how it's administered, and how long does it take to do? So it's a, it's a CCTA. It's a coronary CAT scan. It's a, it's a coronary CT angiography. Um, the company is clearly, you can actually, your, your guests can go on the Clearly website. It's C-L-E-E-R-L-Y. Um, a lot of people have actually called me from other states because they read um, Tony Robbins' book called Life Force, 
and he talks about it extensively in his book and the book is fabulous and again i have you know just as a disclaimer i have no vested interest in his book either but it really is a very interesting book to read uh, it's got just enough science in there but it's really um written for lay people but a lot of people have been interested in the test because of that so you can go on the website look at the the test itself and i'll actually show you um, my my exam uh, and then you can talk to your physician about ordering it. It takes about literally about 15 minutes. You have to have an IV inserted, an intravenous line inserted, because they do give you a little contrast material uh, to show the arteries very clearly. But literally, it takes 15 minutes. It's in a CAT scan machine, and you're in and out in a very short period of time. Uh, the results are back generally in 24, 48 hours. And then the physician can actually go through it line by line, which I'll do with your audience today just to really show the report itself. Uh, and then after that, as you do with your clients, you know, you set up an action plan for them to minimize the risks, to reverse the disease that they may have, and to really set people on the course for healthy living. Is this available globally or only certain like hospitals or doctor's offices doing it? It's actually done at a radiology center. So depending on where you live, um, as a matter of fact, I just recently had two people that called, I think they were in West Virginia. They had to travel a little bit to a, a radiology place that had the technology available. They just have to go to a facility that has the ability to do a CAT scan of the heart, a CT scan of the heart. Wow. Are there other companies doing this test or do they, are they the only one that are doing this? Particular They're the test? only one right now. Yeah, I'm sure that they have patents. <laughs> Yeah, in, the in, zoo, as they say. <laughs> uh, Rachel is saying, well, what about the radiation from the CAT scan? Well, you know, the radiation is minimal because you're in the machine for just a very short period of time. And you also have to remember, you know, just getting on a plane, getting on, on a, taking a, a domestic air flight is you're getting as much radiation as having a, an X-ray, a chest X-ray. So it's, it's hard. You know, what I would do is I would say, okay, let's weigh out the risks. Is the risk of a minimal amount of radiation worth the benefit that you're going to get from this test? And I certainly think that it, that is valuable enough. Again, that I did it myself. Wow, that's the, so. You so you, if I understand you correctly, there's people that appear to have minimal or no risk for cardiovascular disease, but they might have it, and so this test is so sensitive that it would pick that up early. Yes, but what's really interesting, as you know. Because you don't have a disease that's been diagnosed, doesn't mean that you don't have disease that's asymptomatic. And more often than not, people will come to my office and they'll say that, say that they're healthy, but when you really talk to them about how they live, you really start to get clues that they have a lot of risk factors. They may have a slightly elevated total cholesterol or the bad cholesterol, the LDL. Their blood pressure may be on the high side. It may be an individual that really doesn't do any exercise anymore and they're overweight and they have a lot of belly fat, which we all know is, a, is another risk factor for heart disease. So I think more often than not, people think that they're healthier than they are. So I always err on the side of caution once I get that history to say, okay, this is where you're at and we really need to answer some additional questions. So what tests can we do to help clarify a a problem that at that time has not caused any problems yet. You know, what you're really trying to do is avoid a heart attack, avoid a stroke, uh, making sure that people figure out that they need to live healthier before something bad happens. Absolutely. Patty says, is this the same as a coronary calcium scan? So the calcium score is a CAT scan that simply looks at the calcium buildup in your arteries. So this, is, this actually takes it 10, to, 10 steps further because in addition to looking at the artery and looking at how much calcified plaque you have, this test actually shows you how much non-calcified plaque you have and that's the problem type of plaque. Great, thank you. Elizabeth's saying, what about people that are allergic to the contrast? Yeah, well, for those people, it's obviously problematic depending on the type of allergy. You know, the contrast material 
does have some iodine in it. Um, if somebody had a mild reaction, they probably would still be a candidate, but obviously you need to let the doctor and the technician know that beforehand. For people that have had severe reactions to, I, to iodine contrast, then it would be um, really less indicated, obviously. So uh, one of the viewers is asking when they find something in this test, then what do they recommend for the patient? So then depending on how much volume you have, the test actually tells you where you have the disease in the arteries, how much volume of plaque you have in the arteries, and if there's any narrowing, then at that point you sit with the individual. And again, you go through their, their lifestyle habits and you look at how much saturated fat are they getting in the diet? Are they really eating a lot of animal protein? You know, we all know that that's where the saturated fat comes from. So for me, I tell people straight away, if you have cardiovascular disease, you need to be on a plant-based diet. You really need to avoid animal protein because that's where you get all the saturated fat and cholesterol. You should be exercising on a daily basis and doing all of the things, um, you know, changing your behavior in such a way that you, you're living an extremely healthy life to hopefully regress the disease that you have and reverse the disease that you have. That's, that's, it sounds like, I mean, I, I would love to have this test just to brag because I have a, <laughs> I have a 45 year vegan. I have a heart. I can't imagine that I have any cardiovascular disease. You probably have no plaque at all. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I had, um, this was many years ago too. And I, it's, this was, I probably was only vegan, maybe 30 years. And I had a, a serious car accident and right away I was taken for a head injury and had like some kind of cat, something I can't remember. Cause, yeah. but they said that they go, we've never seen anybody this old without any plaque, you know, cause and they weren't, <laughs> they weren't doing the cat scan for that. They were doing it in my head for other reasons. And they go, you yeah. don't have any plaque. And I'm like, well, good. That's cause I've been vegan for 30 you years. You should have said number one, I'm not old. Number two, I'm very happy. Healthy. <laughs> Absolutely. Is this something Medicare covers? Gina wants to know. Not yet, but in, undoubtedly they will. It's probably going to take about five years for that to happen. Uh, but if you think about it, if you can avoid a heart attack or a bypass surgery, uh, the insurance company is uh, inevitably will get on board. Great. All right. Well, I'd love for you to share your screen and show us your score. Yeah. I bet you passed. I did. Um, Congratulations. Uh, here we go. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, let's see. Uh, I got to just, oh, I jumped screen here for a minute. Let's see. Uh, no, I can't see it yet, Dr. Sal. Let's see okay, so. It's so funny. It always works when we practice, but not always when we're. Can't see that? Nope, not yet. Um, make get it, bring it up on your desktop first, and then press screen share. Okay, let me go back here. That's not it. Hang on one second. I just lost it again. Oops, sorry. You can see that now, right? Absolutely can. Oh. Okay, sorry about this. So now I just have to, I just have to get in there again. Oh boy. Sorry about this. I thought I had it pulled up already. Maybe I can ask, I can answer another question while I bring this up. Okay. Oh, well, actually, a couple of questions were sent in in advance. So uh, this is from Char, and she says, can anything be done about the horrible meat-heavy hospital menus, or at least having some yeah. options inserted? She was a patient and got a very tiny meal with sausage and eggs, and it broke her heart, and she gagged, and it made her even sicker. It's amazing that that still happens that people are in the hospital and they actually get bacon and eggs in the morning. You know, um, what you have to do, what I tell my patients to do is just to make sure that they actually talk to the president of the hospital itself and, and just tell them that they, they really need to have vegan uh, options. Because if you're in the hospital for disease, for heart disease, and you're getting a plant-based, and you're not getting a plant-based menu, that's a real problem. 
Can you see the screen now? Yes, I can. Okay, good. I apologize for taking so long. So this is the report that is actually uh, that, that the physician gets. And there is one that also goes to the patient that is a little more uh, uh, directed at lay individuals. But basically, so what the test does is it breaks out the four main arteries, the left main, the left anterior descending, the right coronary artery, and the circumflex. And then it gives you the total amount of plaque volume. So it says plaque volume here. It tells you how much calcified plaque you have. It tells you if you have any non-calcified plaque. And then it tells you, this is the worst category, if you have any low density non-calcified plaque, because low density, pro, low density cholesterol is the really small particle that gets into the inside lining of the artery, and that's what causes significant disease. And again, it measures it in millimeters to the third. Um, so the next part then tells you whether or not you have any mild blockage in there. Stenosis is just a fancy word for blockage. Um, if you have any mild blockage, which, which would be less than 49%. So the arteries obviously have to be open and clean and allow the blood to go through without any obstruction. A moderate stenosis or a moderate obstruction is from 50 to 69%. And something that's severe would be greater than 70%, which basically would mean that 70% of that artery is blocked. And then from here, we start to look at the arteries. So this is actually a picture of the artery itself. And you can see all of this area here, this gray area, this is all clear. There's a little yellow blip here. This is a tiny amount of non-calcified plaque. And it's actually causing no stenosis. The, the term here, it says stenosis severity, the greatest diameter stenosis or narrowing. So even though there's a little bit of non-calcified plaque here, there's no obstruction to the blood flow. And that's the right coronary artery. And then it shows you just some other arteries that come off of the right coronary, and these are completely clean. And then it shows you the left main, which people will say is the widow maker. You know, the left main, if this left main gets blocked, that's this area here. And, and the left main actually uh, breaks off into two Two, two branches, the left anterior descending and the left circumflex. And there's a little bit of cal uh, non-calcified plaque here, but again, no narrowing at all. And then these are just other branches that branch off of that one there, and those are completely clean. You can see all these numbers are zero. The circumflex has just a little bit of non-calcified plaque with the greatest narrowing is 2%. So that basically means that 98% of that artery is open and clean. And what's important here, if this was calcified plaque, it would come, it would show up as blue. Um, so what you what you want to be sure is, so um, when you have a lot of non-calcified plaque, you want to be sure that the individual is on a plant-based diet, and if they have a lot of non-calcified plaque, they should be on a statin medication, because the statin medications will actually turn non-calcified into calcified plaque. So they take the plaque from risk and they stabilize it. So in this scenario here, fortunately, I didn't really have much at all. So I don't need to be on any medication, but I'll certainly be continuing my plant-based diet and make sure that I don't really cheat that often. And the rest of the study is pretty normal. So that's, that's what the test looks like. So any questions there? Yeah, well, Susan wants to know if you already have stents, could you have the test? You can still have it done. Um, but the cart, you would definitely want to speak to your cardiologist to see if it's necessary, because depending on where the stents are, depending on uh, whether or not you have any symptoms, you know, the cardiologist will really want to be very clear about the indication for doing this test, because if an indicate, if a person like that is stable and they're not having any symptoms at all, and they're exercising with no symptoms, there's really no, there's probably in, in many cases, no reason to actually do that. So again, you know, just because this test is available doesn't mean that everybody should run out and have it done. You, you wanna be sure that the benefit far outweighs the risk of any test that's gonna be done. You know, there's, there's no invasive test, even when they're putting in an IV and giving you contrast material, you know, there's still some risk involved and you never want to do a test and then come up with a result that you don't know what to do with. 
you very you really want to be sure that you you know what to do with the results if you're going to order the test. Great, thank you. Let's see. I just saw a question from Karen. What about plaque we develop before going vegan? I've heard you can never clear it. Well, again, the the studies are actually showing that you can convert non-calcified to calcified plaque. But the early studies that were done by Dr. Esselstyn and even uh, the work that's been done by Dean Ornish really has shown through catheterization studies that you can start to clean up those arteries. Um, but even if that's not possible, even if you can't get rid of the calcium, the, uh, the plaque that's there, if you can again convert cal non-calcified plaque, the risky plaque to calcified plaque, then you've done something extremely helpful. Great, thanks. Okay, this was a question that came in from Melissa. My doctor recommended I take magnesium citrate or oxide supplement, which I've been taking in pill form for two years. Is drinking magnesium bicarbonate water safe and effective? I've seen ways to make it at home with sparkling minimal mineral water and milk of magnesia. Not a cardiac question, but. No, right, exactly. Yeah, it's probably, probably helpful for her bowel function, that's for sure. You know, and there's lots of reasons to take magnesium. It, it's, it's also helpful to lower blood pressure, uh, but I'm not really sure what the indication was for the, for the doctor to order that. Uh, sometimes it's helpful for leg, restless leg syndrome. So um, you, can, you can leave that person my email address and if they wanna email me with some more detail, that would be helpful. Do you, do you, since you have a, a concierge practice, is it only for people in Florida? No, I take care of a lot of people outside of the state. Nice. Thank you. Oh, here's a question. Can you have this test if you've already had a bypass? You can, but again, the cardiologist would want to really understand why the test is necessary. So if you've had a bypass, number one, what's really interesting, and I'm sure you've seen this, a lot of people that have a bypass walk out of the hospital actually believing that they no longer have heart disease. And I've seen this time and time again. I mean, I'm coming up on 30 years of doing this and it really is unfortunate that people believe that. Now the bypass itself may bypass, you know, two, three, four, five blocked vessels, but there are literally thousands of blood vessels in your heart. So you have to remember that a lot of those other small arteries are probably blocked also that were not bypassed. So the cardiologist would really want to be clear about what is the reason for having this test done, especially in a person that has no symptoms. If the individual is exercising without any symptoms, then what more value are we going to get by doing this test? But again, that individual should be on a plant-based diet. They should be exercising. They should be doing all the things that will keep the heart healthy and not cause any progression of any of the existing vascular disease. Yep, absolutely. So Adele wants to know who interprets and reads the test. Is it a radiologist? Is it a cardiologist? Maybe both. Um, cardiologists straight away, uh, if they're if they're trained to to read them, you know, I had to go through training to actually interpret these tests. But it's very it's very uh, easy to interpret them. Uh, it, the company does the training for the physician, so. It could be uh, it could be any of the three, to be honest with you. A lot of radiologists will interpret uh, cardiac tests, uh, PET scans, and other things that are done. Uh, and it certainly could be either a cardiologist or a primary care internal medicine family practice doc. Nice. I have a lot of your patients already taken this test. Yeah, actually, um, I've probably had about twenty people in the past couple of months go through the test, and you know, we've we've picked up some really extensive disease in, in some people that didn't think that they really had a lot going on. So it's been extremely beneficial in my practice. That's very cool. Yeah. So I have a question from a live viewer named Sylvia. I had a cardiac IQ panel done 
I forgot my glasses, sorry. And my LDL particles and numbers of them is unfavorable, medium high risk, despite excellent other related numbers. My doctor said this is from my family genetics, which is poor from my dad's side. I already eat whole food, plant-based, no meat, no dairy. I have cheated very minimally recently, not overweight. I exercise daily and have a fasting insulin of 1.74. What else can I possibly do? I am at my wit's end. Yeah. So for that person, you know, this test actually may be helpful because the LDL particles, so if you do a basic lipid panel, you get an LDL number, but you don't know how many, so LDL, LDL particles are really problematic when they're very small because the small particles actually get into the inside lining of the arteries. So when you have a lot of small particles and when the particles are really small, those individuals are more at risk. So for that person, depending on what else is going on in their life, uh, it, this test might actually be helpful because you really wanna see because that individual has a lot of small LDL particles, do they have a lot of soft plaque? Do they have a lot of non-calcified plaque? So that individual may actually, you know, and, and again, she could shoot me an email and I can get some more detail to figure out whether or not that would be useful for her. Nice. Madeline says, Dr. Sal is the person who introduced me to a plant-based lifestyle back in 2013, and I'm forever grateful. That's wonderful. I think I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> she has her whole name in there, Madeline Ruther. Or uh -huh. yep. or, I, I'm sorry, guys, I forgot my glasses. That's why you need to type in caps today because I can't see the small print. So at what age are they recommending this test? Like, I mean, are they doing it on children even? No, not yet. I mean, this is really a test for adults, but uh, that's a great question because we are now diagnosing adult onset diabetes in kids, in young adolescents and kids even younger. And that's that almost sounds like you know what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. You know, how is it that you're diagnosing a kid with adult onset diabetes? The reason that that's happening now is because there is a there is an obesity epidemic in adolescents and younger kids. And the reason that I'm telling you this is because people with diabetes that is not well controlled go on and develop significant vascular disease. They develop blockage in the carotid arteries, in the heart, in the, in the legs, causing peripheral artery disease and such. So for those people, you know, they're, they're at higher risk. So, you know, we would consider doing, doing these tests uh, for, for an individual like that. Great. Thanks. Madeline, uh, uh, no, Jenny says, uh, what about eggs? What about eggs? It's a menstrual period of a chicken. I wouldn't eat that. Ugh. What about eggs? <laughs> well, you have to remember the yolk itself is, is saturated, very high in saturated fat. You get 300 milligrams of cholesterol in, in an egg yolk. So for somebody that already has vascular disease, um, if they insist on eating eggs, I usually just tell them eat the, eat the egg, uh, egg white and, and leave the yolk out. If they can avoid egg, eggs altogether and eat some other non- um, animal protein, that's even better. Great. Sherry says, a person who knows their calcium score, and it's not zero, should you ask her this test if your score is blank? In other words, what number is high enough to help warrant asking for this test? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure that that's really figured out just yet, but I can tell you, you know, if you're in the, if you're above 100 on your calcium score, you really need to talk to your primary care physician or cardiologist to see are there other risk factors that might make this test useful. You really want to be as close to zero as you can be with a calcium score. Nice, thanks. Um, if a scan reveals disease, what step do you recommend next for the patient? So if the scan shows that you have a lot of non-calcified plaque, I sit down with my patients and we spend about an hour together and we go through the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, starting with nutrition and then exercise, sleep, stress management, risky behaviors and social support. You know, and we actually develop a plan for each of those things. And obviously the plan for nutrition is gonna be a plant-based diet, a plant-based nutrition program. I shouldn't use the word diet because it's really a lifelong process. Uh, 30 minutes of exercise, 
on most days of the week, moderately intense exercise, seven to eight hours of sleep every night, quality sleep, managing your stress, having good social support, and not doing other things that are going to be harmful to your health, like smoking cigarettes, vaping, drinking too much alcohol, so on and so forth. Thank you. Karen says her score was 50. Should she get the test? Or 56, excuse me. Well, again, that's pretty low. So I would I would, you know, go through with that person all of their risk factors to see if it's really necessary. If she's exercising and she's asymptomatic, it's it's less likely that she would need that. Thank you. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think I think I caught up with all the questions. That's good. Yeah. So if somebody doesn't li- does live in California, maybe describe how you work with them and how you work with them if they don't, if they're interested in your in your lifestyle medicine practice. Yeah. So, you know, we could do a telehealth visit, which I think is great um, if people can either FaceTime or Zoom. Um, and I, I always spend an hour uh, with all of my patients to be sure that I get to know them and vice versa. You know, I think the one really great thing about, life, you know, the, those of us that that do lifestyle medicine, um, we spend a lot more time with our clients and our patients than traditional physicians and providers do only because they don't have the time. I mean, you know, the, the way traditional healthcare is set up, most primary care doctors and cardiologists really don't have the time that they need. And that's unfortunate. That's, a, that's not saying anything bad about them. That's just the system, the way it's set up. So the value of a lifestyle medicine provider whether it be someone like yourself, a physician, a dietitian, a, a health coach, whomever, is the, the fact that they spend, we spend a lot more time with our clients and our patients to really understand what they're doing in their lives that's either creating health or creating disease. Thanks. Je- Elizabeth says, how you check the plaque? How do you check the plaque? Well, the test, the test that I just showed really delineates and differentiates the plaque itself. The calcium score, as we mentioned before, will tell you whether or not you have calcified plaque, but this clearly CCTA test, this coronary CAT CAT scan, differentiates the two. Thank you. And is there a difference between CCTA and clearly enabled CCTA? No, it's the same test. Same test. It clearly is the company. Clearly is the company. Yeah. Somebody's Googled it and found that there is a place in California and it looks like it's in Orange County. So excellent. There you go. I guess it depends where they live, whether or not they're yes, going to exactly. find it. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Somebody's saying thank you for sharing your email and uh, letting people email you. Let's see if there's any other questions. So you said you've been doing a uh, plant based diet for 10 years now. What were you doing before that? And how did you find out about that based <laughs> diet? <laughs> I was living a, a traditional, uh, you know, American Italian lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, with lots yeah. of oil, right? Right, right. You know, I mean, it's really disease sometimes goes along with culture. Uh, and certainly if you live in America and you're eating the standard American diet, if you, if you have, uh, you know, like me, uh, an Italian background, um, meat was always was always on the table and less vegetables and such. So a lot of us were brought up in, you know, with that type of a, you know, uh, a family heritage, if you will. But, you know, after a while, uh, probably after the first 15 years of practicing internal medicine, what I recognized was that people that eat healthier were always healthy, healthier. So I decided at some point, you know, I really wanted to do this for myself and encourage my kids to do that and 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 really just encourage my patients and friends and family that you want to live long and, you know, like Spock says, live long and prosper, right? You can't do that if you're living an unhealthy life. Wow. Do you know, do you happen to know Dr. Frank Sabatino, who's also in Florida? I, I know of him. I'm not sure that I ever met him. Oh, he's great. You remind me of him. I adore him and you remind me of him. You know, he's same thing, Italian American. Um, right. Olive oil's a, you know, you, you know, you, you pretty much bathe in it. And, and <laughs> exactly. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Angela says, can you give me some advice to inform someone who believes in the Atkins or keto diet? <laughs> That's my advice. You have to look at Atkins and keto and South Beach 
as you well know, th that's the standard American diet. It's just renamed as something else. And people that are doing keto diets, they usually do that because they're looking to lose weight, which they usually do. But invariably, if you stay on a, on a, on a keto diet, which is basically very high in animal fat, you will definitely at some point need a clearly test because you'll develop cardiovascular disease. So I strongly recommend to people that that is not the right way to be healthy. I, I agree. There's a question. Do you think that uh, brain artery stenosis could reverse in the same way as cardiac artery stenosis could with a plant-based diet? Well, you know, the saying is what's good for the heart is good for the brain and vice versa. So the answer, the short, short answer is yes. And if you think about the fact that Alzheimer's and different types of dementias, which are probably primarily vascular in origin, um, has been going up year after year, decade after decade. And if you look at the statistics on how many people will have so-called Alzheimer's disease by 2050, the situation is going to get much worse. So what I tell people, and, and there are no good treatments for Alzheimer's. The medications that are on the market do not work. So the only thing to do is to try and prevent it from happening in the first place. And again, if you're living a, a lifestyle that's good for the heart, that's good for the brain. Yep, absolutely. So Almost every guest on Chef AJ Live gets asked the question what they eat in a day, but I'm thinking let's make it more fun for you, Dr. Sal, since you're a lifestyle medicine doctor and promote the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Yeah. How do you, how do you uh, employ all six pillars of lifestyle medicine in your day? So this morning I actually had some pea soup that I made over the weekend, you know, which had a bunch of vegetables in there and my 14 year old actually said she loved it. So she's my test case. Um, you know, in the morning, if I don't, I, a lot of mornings I'll actually fast um, from the night before and have my first meal at around noontime, which I find really helpful. I like to exercise during the fasting period. So I run in the morning. I like to exercise during in the fasting state so that I could burn off some body fat, you know. Um, and then probably for me, honestly, sleep is probably my, my worst, my worst nightmare. I'll use that term. You know, some, some nights I'll sleep four or five hours and then I'm wide awake. Uh, but the other, the other pillars I really just try to focus on, because again, when we have so many responsibilities in our lives, whether it's family and jobs and other things that you want to take care of, you have to take care of yourself. If you don't do those things it's going to be difficult. And certainly we all would like to get to a time when we can at least partially retire and travel more and enjoy life. Right. And you can't do that without good health. So that those are my goals. Fantastic. Karen says, do you recommend any supplements such as black seed, chia seeds, garlic? I don't know what C O O O is. Oh, I, I, Sorry, guys, C-O-Q-O. Oh, that's, probably CoQ, that's probably CoQ10. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so she's mixing up herbs and spices with supplements, but certainly, uh, and I'm sure you talk to your, your clients about this also, uh, vitamin B12, if you're on a plant-based diet, you definitely need to supplement with that. Everybody that I test in my clinic is vitamin D deficient, so vitamin D3 is high on the list. CoQ10 is a great cardiac enzyme. Um, that a lot of people need, especially as we get older, because the heart doesn't seem to produce as much of it. Uh, and then the other things that she mentioned, obviously you want, you really want to be sure that you're having flaxseed and, um, you know, I know that there's some controversy, but I'm, I, I tell people, you know, you really want to be sure that you're getting healthy fats in your diet. So I don't have a problem with people eating avocado but flax seeds and walnuts and other ways to get the healthy omega-3 fats in your diet is important. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. That was a good one. And Angela says, we must take good care of ourselves, exercise, take care of body, mind, and soul. When, when did you first hear about lifestyle medicine? Because to get board certified, you had to, you had to take a test, right? Yeah. Yeah. I got board certified a number of years ago. Um, I started going to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine annual meetings, oh God, probably 10 years ago when they had it first down, down here in Naples. 
So I really, you know, I, I became very involved with them. I was actually on their board for three years. Um, and as you, as you know, all of the, the people, all of the people in this world, you know, uh, that, that are involved in lifestyle medicine really support one another. So it's been really a great journey since then. And actually the, uh, the next conference is coming up in November. Uh, for the people that are on the line here. So you can go to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, website. And um, the annual conference is at the Rosen Creek Resort in Orlando, Florida this year. Um, and I will certainly be there because the speakers are fabulous and it's great education. So, you know, when I became involved, I just, I just realized how important this was as a subspecialty of medicine. And it was the reason that I started my own concierge practice, just because I think it's really valuable to have a practitioner and a team around the patient or the client, if you will, that knows a lot about lifestyle medicine. Yeah, it, you know, you you would think that lifestyle medicine would be the default, and then they'd have to get board certified to do something else. You know what exactly. I'm saying? Right, exactly. Well, as you know, we're working on it, and ACLM membership has gone up so dramatically over the years. I don't know the exact number right now of, of members, but it's in the thousands. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's more and more every year, there's more and more practitioners, not only physicians, but other, other healthcare providers that are becoming certified in lifestyle medicine. And, you know, you can go on the website and find a practitioner in your area if you're interested. What's cool though is any doctor with any specialty right now could get board certified in that, you know, and yep. still do, still do whatever they're doing, which is kind exactly. of cool, whether they're right. an emergency room doctor, you know, a, a yep. orthopedic. So it's open to everyone. So that's pretty yeah. cool. Uh, Nikki, who's watching live says my triglycerides are, where did that go? 220. What should I do to correct this? Yeah. You know, 220 is not that high. The goal for triglycerides is less than 150, but I would look at the amount of sugar that she's eating. You know, sugar glucose um, is used, your cells use a certain amount of glucose for energy and what's left over is actually converted to triglycerides and the excess of triglycerides actually ends up accumulating in your liver and that can increase your risk for liver problems, including liver cancer, if the number gets really high and also pancreatitis. So I would start with looking at the amount of sugar in the diet and the amount of fats in the diet. And again, you know, doing a really comprehensive history and a, and getting a detailed list of when my patients tell me that they eat healthy, I specifically ask them, okay, tell me what you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. Do you do any fasting? I mean, you really want to know the particulars because everybody believes that they eat healthier than they, everybody do. Yeah. Everybody believes that they eat healthier than they really do. Absolutely. That's so true. Uh, people are asking, how do they find a lifestyle medicine doctor in their area? So if they go on the American College of Lifestyle Medicine website, there's a resource on the website uh, to find a doctor. Great. I'll see yeah, if I can get other, that. You know, the other national, well, it's, there's a couple of them, actually. You know, there's, then there's Plantrition. You know, on the Plantrition website, they also have a, a resource for uh, plant-based doctors. Uh, through probably through Dr. Barnard's uh, PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. You can go on that website and also find um, a plant-based doctor. So there's a lot of resources out there. Thank you. Claudette says, what are the steps to getting off blood pressure meds? Well, this definitely the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. You want to look to see why that individual has blood pressure, has high blood pressure in the first place. And, you know, the value of lifestyle medicine is that we as providers look for the root cause of disease, as opposed to just using a medication or a Band-Aid, if you will, to take care of the, pro the, the symptom itself. You know, blood pressure in many cases is a symptom of something else. Is the individual uh, eating a high salt diet? Do they have really high cholesterol so that they're, they develop hardening of the arteries? So. The first step is to figure out why the individual had blood, high blood pressure in the first place and then try to work on the root cause of the problem so that you can get them off medication. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I, this last week on Chef AJ Live, it was longevity week and I interviewed people that were vegan for a very long time in their 50s. Mm -hmm. 
70s and 80s. Yeah. And one of the things, and I'm just curious what, what you think about this, because, you know, we, we always hear about the blue zones and it doesn't seem like it was just one thing they did, many things. Right. But one thing I noticed about all my guests that really looked good and aged well, they don't drink alcohol. And I'm right. curious what you think about alcohol in general yeah. for, you know, because they say, oh, heart, you know, red wine is heart healthy. Yeah. You know, there really are no studies that actually show that alcohol is healthy. There are lots of studies that show that alcohol, certainly in excess, uh, causes problems from the brain on down. It increases the risk of dementia, heart disease, kidney and liver problems, so on and so forth. Um, so even though the recommendation is for a woman, no more than one drink per day, for a man, no more than two drinks per day, there really is not a lot of research that supports that alcohol is a healthy thing to drink. So if we really are strict about the recommendations, you know, um, in the PIVIO program that I run, which was previously called, called the CHIP program, um, it's a plant-based nutrition program. We don't recommend any alcohol at all. Absolutely. What about coffee? Because we also hear mixed things about that. Yeah, and, and again, well, not again, um, there really are no hard study, hard research studies to show that coffee is problematic for most people, unless you already have problems with your heart, uh, irregular heart rhythms. You know, if you're drinking so much coffee and getting so much caffeine that you're giving yourself palpitations, obviously that's a problem. But drinking coffee in moderation really does not seem to be a major risk factor. I, I was watching Dr. McDougall's uh, brought live broadcast yesterday, and he was saying that it can raise cholesterol. I'm not sure how, it, I'm not sure what that mechanism would be, to be honest with you. I'd have to look into that. Yeah. yeah. Um, or, you know, or, the or, only concern that I get is, you know, like any other, like any other um, product that's grown is the amount of pesticide on the coffee beans a problem. You know, that would be my only that my other concern, you know, so a lot of people will actually buy organic uh, coffee beans and grind them themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he said, see, he used the word exogenous cholesterol. So I don't know if that's different than is there an endogenous cholesterol? Well, yeah, there's endogenous what you make yourself and exogenous is what you're getting from the outside. So but I'm not sure I'd have to look up what mechanism I can't think off the top of my head what the mechanism would be whereby coffee itself would raise your cholesterol i'd have to look into and he that. said something that the way you filter it is i, I you know i am sorry I, I watched it you know last night and i didn't i didn't you know it was since, since i don't drink it i don't remember stuff that's not important yeah. to me because i'm <laughs> right. not gonna i'm not i don't care what you come out with i'm not going to start drinking coffee or start drinking yeah, alcohol. exactly right yeah so let's see uh, what about dark chocolate what about well, it yeah you know dark chocolate in moderation, you know, probably one or two squares, not a whole bar, you know, because of the cacao uh, is supposed to be helpful. But you have to remember that any can, you know, dark chocolate is still a candy, if you will, um, might have enough sugar in there that it becomes more of a health concern than anything. It's again, you know, there are, the last time I looked, there were about 56 names for sugars. So you have to think about, is there hidden sugar in the stuff that you're eating? And are you really getting a benefit or not? Yeah, but you know, but who among us really can practice moderation? What are we up to now? 70, 72% or 84% overweight, half of them obese? I mean, oh yeah, really yeah, I think we're at 70%, yeah. I mean, who really can eat one square of dark chocolate? And right, if exactly. they can, they don't need our help because they clearly <laughs> exactly. don't have a problem. Right. Okay, true. so we have very smart viewers who are saying it's French press coffee that can raise cholesterol because of the oil in the bean. But if it's filtered, it won't. So thank you for that. But I wonder how much how much coffee do you have to drink for that to happen? I'd have to look there. Is there really any research that shows... Uh, I, could, I could understand that, that if there's oil in the beans, but how much oil is really in the beans that it would cause that? So I'm going to have to look into that more because that's that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is really interesting, this uh, new technology, you know. Yes. And, uh, 
you know, I, I don't think I'm a candidate, but I, I mean, I, I don't like the contrast. I, cause I, I, it makes me vomit when I've had contrast. I mean, oh, I don't yeah. have a serious reaction, like an yeah. allergy, but, but I, every time I've had contrast, you know, I've gotten nause, nause, nauseated and vomited. So I think yeah. I am a little bit to iodine, but I yeah. wouldn't think that you would be a candidate with the lifestyle that you live. Yeah. Yeah. You but I do. Like, I, you I, still look like you're 21. Oh, thank you. No, but I, I, I'd have it just to brag, you know, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> just for bragging. Right. Oh, right, Stephanie right. wants to know, is decaf coffee the same, you know, or like whatever the, the, the problem that may be with coffee is decaf the same. It still has caffeine is my understanding. It has and less, it's still, you know, it's a pro it's still pro very processed, you know, so are there it's chemicals so heavily sprayed and the way the workers right. are treated, I wouldn't eat, I would avoid coffee and chocolate just for ethical reasons. Yeah. For, yeah. That's true. Really. Really, that's a good thought. No, but that that's you know, we we you know, one step at a time for people. So, mm -hmm. you know, let's see. Well, you are just you should be speaking at the lifestyle medicine conference. Well, actually, I'm doing a workshop this year uh for physicians that um want to do uh lifestyle medicine and to run like a chip program, a fibio program in their practice, because the concern has always been, you know, how do you actually how do you actually get paid for doing lifestyle medicine in your practice? Because there are no, there's not a lot of codes to do that. And that really has been one of the, one of the problems for primary care docs. You know, obviously we all need to, to make a salary. So is it, um, is it easy to do that in a practice? And that's, that's the, um, the gist of the workshop that I'm doing. Uh, could you imagine if doctors were only paid for keeping people well? Boy, they go broke. The key. That's yeah. the key. <laughs> yeah, right. They, that would, right now that with, the current, the with the yeah. current model, they'd all pretty much go broke. Yeah. Exactly. So value-based care would be, you know, you want to see that you're, that you're, number one, that you have to be working with a compliant individual. And then if that patient's getting healthier, yeah. then obviously that's, that's beneficial all the way around. Yeah, the problem is we, you know, we, it seems people want a pill for every ill and, and to go to lifestyle medicine, it requires that you take control of your health and not outsource it. But again, you know, you're sacrificing now so that you don't have to sacrifice later on. And you know this, I mean, if you, and it's really not even a sacrifice. I never feel like I'm sacrificing anything. I eat healthy food. I exercise. I feel great after I do that. You know, I'm working on my sleep. So I never feel that I'm depriving myself in any way. It's really a thought process. But I know for a fact that if I didn't do this, what I would be sacrificing later on is quality health, longevity, time with my kids, you know, and an inability to do the things that I would want to do as I got older. So it is yeah. not a deprivation at all. And there is nothing more important than taking care of your health. So for the people that are on the line, take care of your health and it will take care of you. Absolutely. The only thing we deprive ourselves of is heart disease, diabetes, exactly. obesity, you know, absolutely. Right. Well, it's, it's just such a pleasure catching up with you, Dr. Sal. You too, AJ. Nice to see you as always. Nice to see you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we'll be talking about the benefits of green tea, particularly 